Housewives of Alaska. And this is Marnell, and I really have nothing clever to say because, like, we podcasted a lot this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not done yet. No, and the one that we did yesterday is actually with um, Phil from Capes and Lunatics, and it actually will not come out until late December. It's his end of year podcast. Correct. So, yeah. Yeah. It was we'll a lot try of fun. and keep you um, up to date on when that is posted. So this week we are taking a much more serious turn because I'm sorry, <laughs> last week just wasn't serious enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but so, not quite as serious as City of Joy. Uh, no, I mean, I think it's interesting that you referenced City of Joy because it evoked some some similar things for me in terms of... I am really sad. This makes me really sad, but I'm really grateful for the things that I have in my life, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, they also, another one, they, I mean, if you have such serious subject, subject matter, uh, can you do anything but end on hope, you know? <laughs> right. Although I'm, uh, I don't know, we'll go there. So <laughs> this week we are talking about Code Black, which, depending on which internet reference you look at, it was either a 2013 or 2014 documentary that was made about the L.A. County Hospital Emergency Room. And yeah. And, Marnell, this is your credit, all credit to you, because you had mentioned this movie and mentioned that it was really good. And, um, and I quite agree. Yeah, so um, it's, Unfortunately, I don't think it's on Netflix anymore. It is um, Amazon Prime, but Netflix is where I originally watched it. And I started watching it and like 30 minutes in, I, you know, went to my other half and I was like, you, we have to watch this. Like, I, I'm not going to be the only one that watches this. It's an amazing movie. And then I found out they were making a television series uh, based on the documentary movie, and it also turned out great. I watched all four seasons that aired. Unfortunately, it did not get brought back after 2018, but yeah, uh, and what's funny is in the television show, they actually pulled a few of the patients um, that we see in the documentary. They, they kind of pulled some real-life stories from the documentary and kind of fictionalized them and um, probably took a lot of creative license, but, uh, like the, the gentleman in the chair singing, I think that happens at the end of episode one. Oh. And then the lawyer who broke her foot, she, 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 she doesn't make an appearance personally, but like there's a character, a character in an episode where same thing. So yeah, I, I love this. I knew it was going to be right up your alley. And I, you know, it's going to be good to podcast about considering current events. Well, and I found out and I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but here we go. So <laughs> Ryan McGarry, who is one of the fourth year residents, one of the resident physicians who is part of the cast, who also was the director and the writer, one of mm -hmm. the writers, um, was behind several episodes of Pandemic, which made a big splash on Amazon, or not Amazon, Netflix earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And I think I may be the only person on the planet who hasn't watched Pandemic. I haven't. Okay, so we're the only two people on the planet who haven't watched it. And <laughs> it's actually... Oh, go ahead. I bet I'm going to. Right, well, I was thinking we might have to watch it and talk about it for this. Yeah. Um... So it's a docu-series about fighting influenza and about keeping influenza from becoming a global pandemic again. And it was made and released this year, and now here we are. <laughs> so... Kind of fortuitous. You, you, you'd think the guy, like, had some medical knowledge in his Right. <laughs> I would... So... And I'm kind of jumping all, all the way, jumping into bycatch already, but I would so love an update on all of these resident physicians, because at this point, they had not quite graduated from their residency, and now they're, what seven six seven years into practice right Pro probably probably seven or eight years into practice by this point by the time the movie was made and edited and put out 
Um, so I would really like to know more about each of them. Yeah. And going back, of course, I, I watched this a year or two ago. Um, I going back and watching this now, I look at it through the lens of COVID Mm -hmm. and that the very first scene that we open up on and there's like, they're packed in this, you know, emergency room. And they, I mean, they literally like, they have no elbow room. I have no idea how they function and do intubation. And Oh, girl, we are so going to talk about (laughs) LA County ER and COVID. We are so going to talk. Yeah, and then a waiting room with 300 people for right. like six days straight. I just, I right. I can't fathom that then, let alone now. So, yeah. go ahead and rate it for me. I, I have a feeling that like we're going to only podcast about documentaries that we love and, and give five stars too. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty close to five stars, but I'm not quite at five stars. There were a couple of things, but you, you first, ladies first. Uh, and you did inform us yesterday that you are a Scottish lady, so ladies first. <laughs> um, I, yeah, five stars. Uh, I I don't have the the medical knowledge and background that you do, so I'm sure there are some things that you are going to be able to point out that I missed or wouldn't know or yeah maybe you're a little bit jaded I think I'm a little bit jaded you did serve some time in the ER didn't you Uh, I worked in the ER for several years actually although you know caveat up front telling all the listeners all six of them that um I didn't ever work in an ER that saw things to this magnitude i mean we certainly had traumas in the er in which i i actually worked in a couple of different emergency rooms and i've seen some bad traumas but i didn't see 12 hours straight of one horrible trauma where you're cutting somebody open after another i mean you know or having to put off somebody who you know uh, right i mean they're coming in for a migraine turns out they have a tumor right or they're coming in because their foot hurts and it turns out, you know, they, they have diabetes and they need their foot cut off. You know, like, yeah. I mean, honestly, and like our wait times in the emergency rooms where I worked were anywhere from, you know, a few minutes to a couple of hours, depending on how crazy it was. Right. Now, right, I will I... say about the little tiny emergency room that I worked in, which was in a rural critical access hospital, um... I, I laughed when they were showing all of these different scenes of different resuscitations because I was like, huh, I don't think I've ever worked a resuscitation where there's been that many people in the room. Right. <laughs> I don't think I've ever worked a resuscitation where we've had that many hands on deck. Okay. Well, <laughs> of course, this is also a teaching hospital, right. too. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I just... The thought of an ER for me doesn't always evoke uh, the chaos that that um, county Los Angeles County uh, emergency room does. Uh, um, but, I am going to tell you this is a bycatch thing also, but like when they were showing a moment relatively early on when they were still in what did they call it C booth? Uh, yeah, when they were still in C booth and they had they called a code. And they were showing the janitor cleaning up and there was just a pool of blood and like packages from Mm -hmm. intubation kits and drugs and IVs and, you know, just packages thrown on the floor. Yep. I've been there, done that, seen that, cleaned up after that because when you're night shift in a little tiny hospital, you're the nurse, you're the respiratory therapist, you may or may not be the lab tech and you're the janitor when all is said and done. (laughs) And you go get coffee. And you go get coffee. Yeah. Um, but to me, the ER, oh, it for me, always is you get everything. You get car crashes. You get heart attacks. You get ear, you know, children right. with ear yeah. infections. And you, generally like, speaking, that's true. I mean, and, yeah. and in tiny ERs, you can go hours with nothing or be slammed from the minute you walk into the minute that you leave. I was going to say, as soon as somebody's like, man, slow night. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Shut up. So there are, there's a certain word that we never say in the ER. I'm not sitting in an emergency room, so I feel like I can say it. We don't say the word quiet. Yep. It will earn you 
weeks of silence and possibly <laughs> getting shivved in the ladies room if you say the word <laughs> if you say the word quiet oh uh, i can only imagine <laughs> yeah i mean i i always see it as from the patient side but yeah i i have been in many uh er through throughout my life having the severe asthma that i have right. so yeah so what did you rate it so I gave it 4.8 stars out of 5. I said, excellent, highly recommend. I also said 4.8 hour-long resuscitation efforts out of 5. <laughs> 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 because I just can't get away from the way that we rate it biters. I think that's a lot more fun. Um, I, I think it was really amazing. And I do think that probably I watched it with a little bit of a jaded eye just because of all of the years that I've been in healthcare were going on 30 years and, and all of the years that I worked in the emergency room. So yeah, I mean, I, it wasn't quite a five for me, but it was pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely ranks right up there. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a solid a for sure. Um, it, I didn't really have any numbers. The IMDb page was pretty small and the Wikipedia was pretty small. It did win three awards so mm -hmm. in 2013. So I think it must have had like small release in 13 and then bigger release in 2014 because it's listed as a 2014 documentary when you look at the Prime Amazon Prime listing. Yeah, and I like I said, I... I um... I, I thought I had watched it like a year ago, but time means nothing anymore. Right. And so I know that I watched it before the TV show came out. So oh, I and probably... the TV show came out in like 2015. 2015. Or 20... Yeah. Yep. So you so probably I've... watch it pretty quickly after it was released. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I watched it like just a few months before because I remember uh, recording it on the DVR and like it was like code black what wasn't that the documentary like so i i remember watching it fairly close to then so yeah uh five years ago not not like a year year and a half it's been five years wow <laughs> time means nothing time means it, nothing yeah. zero all right yeah. anyway so it did win three awards in 2013 it won audience favorite documentary at the aspen film fest it won, I'm assuming, Best Documentary, just a documentary, at the Hamptons International Film Fest. And then at the LA Film Fest, it won the Best Documentary. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was it was incredibly good. And um, as I mentioned, the writer was Ryan McGarry, who was one of the resident physicians, and Joshua Altman, who it just says on his IMDb that he is an editor and producer. And he's got a couple of other things to his credit, a thing called Minding the Gap, a documentary called The Price of Free, which is about, it looks like it's about exploiting children for labor. Um, and then one called The Final Year, which is a documentary about the last year of Barack Obama's second term. Hmm. And then, like I said, Ryan McGarry was involved in Pandemic, which now I really want to watch. And the, the subtitle of Pandemic is How to Prevent an Outbreak. And it, it specifically is about how to prevent an influenza outbreak. Although now I think it would be very interesting watching it through COVID eyes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So our director was also Ryan McGarry, and he was a producer on the TV series as well. So he certainly, being an, an L.A. doctor, has his hands in Hollywood as well. <laughs> I thought it was really interesting. Some of the, the senior physicians that they referenced throughout the documentary were actually executive producers on this documentary. Um, so I will tell you now that Ryan McGrady is actually my, uh, housewife hero of the week. Well, we're headed right into that. So why don't you go ahead and talk about Ryan? Um, so he actually started filming this documentary when he, he was in med school. Um, and of, uh, of course we see kind of through, he, he's the first person you hear in the documentary and we see it, uh, kind of through his lens and, 
I mean that literally and figuratively. Uh, he actually filmed the first half of the the documentary himself um, because he thought his colleagues would feel more comfortable with, you know, one of their own filming sure, it that rather than having. Yeah. So um, but by the second half, uh, you know, he was well into being a resident and um he he said he didn't take any vacation for three years uh, between uh, doing his classes and his residency and also doing this documentary. Um, Yeah, and he seems like he's got uh, the the pandemic thing. So I'm not entirely sure if he, how much he still practiced, but if you go to his Instagram, which is... Oh, that's so funny that he's got an Instagram. Of course he does. <laughs> it's Mayan R.C. Gary. Yeah, I don't know why. And that's also his Twitter handle. I don't know what that means, but... Um, uh, and I want to was... point out, he's a cancer survivor, which that was incredibly shocking, like halfway through the documentary. Yes, yes. Yeah, I was like, What? Um, so he's got some, some pictures on his Instagram that, um, looks like he probably still works, but he, um, adorably had, looks like he has two dogs, an Airedale and maybe a Portuguese water dog. Oh, right on. Well, Uh, I, I really hope he still works because, you know, one of the things about all of the physicians who were involved in this documentary, they're doing it for the right reasons. Most definitely. And I, I love that he, he started this documentary. um, And when he did, he didn't know, you know, what it was going to be in that, you know, halfway through filming this documentary, the 1994 Northridge earthquake happens, and the medical center gets shut down. um, Which they don't make that very clear in the documentary. No, no. I, I, you had said something to me about, oh, and then it got redesigned because of the earthquake. And I was like, wait, did I miss something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I forget how they uh, how old they said the building was. But, I, you know, it's been there for like 100 years or something. Um, um, it was dedicated in the 1920s, I believe. So almost 100 okay. years. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you you would understand how it, you know wasn't up to California's earthquake code. Um I it's really disappointing cuz I the building was beautiful, but of course when Ryan started filming this, you know, they you had sea booth and I, I he had the idea that, you know, he was going to film this documentary about this teaching hospital and everything. And what it kind of turned out to be is what we see with medicine today. And I know that you and I will get into it because I'm sure you have a lot of feelings about paperwork. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I had to laugh because I was listening to aim for the head and they were talking about us on biters and Diana and Steve were both like, Diane, step away from the charting. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so you know, he, he also, he goes into talking about, um, you know, what it it was and sort of what it became. And he ends one of his interviews with, ask yourself this, when you go to the doctor, how many times do you explain your allergies? I bet it's more than once. This redundancy is for safety, but all three people who you talk to are recording the same thing so that if they get sued, it would be on the record. But that's time that could be better spent making personal connections. So I hope that people walk away really thinking about this system from a patient's perspective and a doctor's perspective. And, Um, and, you know, the thing that I really want people to come away with as um, as patients is that we work really hard. mm -hmm. We work really hard and we we do a lot behind the scenes that you don't see. Yeah. So one of the things that I wrote down is um, after they redesigned the new County hospital uh, so that it was a little bit more like Seabooth, 
um, they're sort oh, of... we're going to talk about that, oh, too. Okay, yeah, their, their <laughs> motto go, going forwards was patient f- first, paperwork last. And it made me think of you and how you go home from doing your full-time work and you come home and you chart after work and you get up early and you chart and you stay in on the weekends and chart, you know? Uh, so uh, yeah, that just, it, it makes me really sad to think about that. Yeah. We work a lot. Um, so it says that Ryan McGreary, uh, is an emergency medicine doctor. So it kind of sounds like he's still practicing. This is as of Wednesday, uh, January 29th, 2020. Um, so it, it's talking about the, uh, pandemic and how to prevent an outbreak that was earning buzz from, uh, fast company. They called it required viewing in the time of c- the coronavirus outbreak. Um, it kind of sounds like you open up the series, uh, on the 1918 pandemic flu. So he'll go through that in the series. I still have a book on my Kindle about the 1918 pandemic that was released this year that of course my, my Kindle is stacked high with books that I will probably not get to. (laughs) (laughs) So he's not very active on Twitter other than um, kind of retweeting other people. Um, I love that he retweeted a tweet from Rob Lowe that says, I wonder how canceled Code Black being the number one show of the night fits into CBS's new business model, asking for a friend (laughs) and a crew of 150 people. Uh, Because Rob Lowe was on the show. Okay. Um, but the pinned tweet on his Twitter that I, I thought was interesting is I've spent my filmmaking career chronicling heroes among us. I'm hearing that some of you have been bullied and threatened by hospital leadership, boiling point to a bigger issue beyond COVID. Reach out to me privately if you have a story to tell, to tell confidentiality assured. I know a so- nurse who went up against his hospital in the Midwest because they were making nurses go home in their scrubs and launder their scrubs themselves where they provide scrubs for physicians. And he was like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not having any of this in the middle of a COVID outbreak. I'm going to go help myself to a pair of physician scrubs. Thank you very much. And you can launder them at the end of my shift. (laughs) 20, 20 applications later, several months later, he does not have a job. And he's, he is an ER nurse with 13 years of experience. So and talk about bullied by hospital systems. Oh, girl. Yeah. So it kind of sounds like he's got his um, idea for his next documentary on his hands. Good. So. I hope so. Because yeah. I will tell you that one of the things that is so incredibly broken about our healthcare system as a healthcare provider is that we are nothing but cogs in a great big wheel and we are it's made very clear to us that we can be very easily replaced see and i think if you more as meat for the grinder (laughs) you guys guys just get ground down you know um even even the the doctors that um work in in public health um because of course i work for public health uh have said that we are seeing medical professional burnout at an unprecedented rate, you know? My mantra for the last several months has been, nobody cares. Nope. Nobody cares. Nope. And we will talk more about that. (laughs) Ryan Prairie, I actually, when I first watched this, I did not know that uh, he was the writer, director, producer for this um so when i picked him as my um kind of cast member housewife hero i did not realize that he was the director so oh when, my gosh when we that's started, so funny right before we started podcasting i'm like oh crap we're gonna talk about him anyway so <laughs> <laughs> i did kind of want to give an honorable mention to um luis enriquez the nurse the, yep. yes the senior er nurse yes. so um, if you watch the television show Code Black, uh, 
hate the character uh, Jesse Salander, who they call Mama, who is the head nurse, uh, is Luis Guzman. And he does an absolutely fantastic role. Um, I I just loved the character on the show. And I I don't think they spent enough time with the real life inspiration Luis Enriquez are in. Um, he is a 27 year veteran veteran of emergency trauma nurse in LA County's USC Trauma Center. In addition to clinical practice, he serves as an adjunct clinical instructor and lecturer. He is a graduate of LA County School of Nursing and California State Polytech University. He's got a BS in chemistry. Luis is also part of the volunteer faculty for Good Samaritan Medical Ministry and has taught emergency nursing in Vietnam for the past three years. And this is um, from the the documentary's website. So this is probably 2014 information. Wow. Uh, he has two grown children, Laura and Michael, and his wife, Evelyn. Very cool. Yeah. So I just kind of want to throw out an honorable mention for him because... Yeah, no, he does. So he broke my heart when he was talking about kind of the the chaos and the indignity of the sea booth and how he had to take that family member into view her mom's body, like in the back where they stored the urinals. Mm -hmm. And there was a mentally ill patient screaming for sanity. Right. I mean, he he definitely touched my heart and he obviously cares about what he does. I mean, I, I really actually genuinely believed that every single person in that hospital system cared about what they were doing. Yeah, but nurses always have a special place in my heart. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, trust me, we are just as flawed as the rest of them. <laughs> well, okay, so, and th- and it's always been that way because the nurse is the one who spends the most time with you when you're in the ER. We're going to talk um, about that, too. Okay. <laughs> I'm so just going to have- say, oh, go ahead. Having having spent a lot of time in ERs, I've I've been around a lot of nurses. So not to mention I'm related to some. So, so I'm just gonna go say very quickly that my housewife's hero was I'm gonna completely slaughter his na- his name Arash Kohanteb, who was the I'm assuming he's he's Muslim and that sounds like a very Egyptian name. And he was the um, the fellow that we watched who w- was directing his first code and then had to go out and tell the daughter that the mom had passed. Mm-hmm. And I, as I was watching it, I was thinking, okay, 2013, 2014, we're not quite at the height of our craziness about Muslim people in this country. What must it be like to be him now? Because I bet he's still working as an emergency room doctor. I bet he's still working with the underserved. And I bet things have gotten pretty ugly. Yeah. And I that it actually kind of makes me wonder about um, Danny Chang. The, right. Yeah, so and, I've got uh, Danny is I have I have some issues with Danny. OK. I have a and, few issues with Danny, but I understand. I think I know where you're, you're headed, which is the whole. Yes. Wuhan flu, China yes. virus, which neither one of us endorses that at the appropriate to- no. term is COVID-19. Um, also, Jamie Ng, the the female. Right. Of, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I kind of, I, I wonder about if they face the same stigma specifically because they are working in a medical invite. Like, I, I remember. I, you know, there are definitely, I have run into patients who are like, I'm not going back to that doctor because that doctor was black. And I'm like, are, are you kidding me? Right. Are, did you did you just say that to me? Yeah. I had someone tell me they wouldn't see a surgeon again because she was female. I was like, I just need you to hear me out that she's one of the best surgeons that we have in this area. So don't say things like that to me. You know, I actually feel like there was an episode of Code Black, the TV show, that actually dealt with something just like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Where... There is a tremendous amount of racism and misogyny in healthcare. Yeah. And it, yeah, it and is directed. I, I mean, it's, it's, it, is, it is bilateral. It is directed 
to patients by healthcare providers. It is directed at healthcare providers by patients. Yeah. Ugh. See, I was a little triggered watching this documentary. <laughs> like I said, I knew it was right up your alley. Uh, okay, so I've got a bunch of things in Housewives Weekly, and they're mostly COVID and healthcare related. Um, they're a little, well, yeah, they're pretty political too. So here we are. Um, so first, I don't know if you realize this, but on Friday, Washington, Oregon, and California got together and and created a tra- created a holiday travel advisory. No. And basically, the three governors of those states said, if you don't have to travel, don't. Don't have Thanksgiving outside of your immediate family that you spend all of your time with outside of your immediate household. So, you know, what What was it? Was it Tuesday? No, it was Thursday, wasn't it? It was Thursday week? that we had our little alert, our little Nixel alert from our governor. Yeah, um, they he triggered the emergency alert system on via phone, which is probably not that big of a deal to people in lower 48, because I think they use that for um, things like uh, hurricanes. Well, and I just want to say right now that the housewives both agree that he's kind of a moron. So <laughs> <laughs> he needs to listen to Dr. Ann Zink a lot more than he does. She is our state medical director. And she's fabulous. Yes, she is fabulous. I've worked with her personally, and she is fabulous. Anyway, sorry. So, yes, on Thursday, our governor decided to trigger our little emergency alert system via our phones. And I think that was the first time I have ever had that happen to me. Um, Like, ever. I I seriously, I I looked around, I was like, where is that coming from? There's no TVs on. I, you know, if, if, if for me, I was in the office and, of course, everybody's phone started going off and I was like, right. what the what? And I thought, you know, I thought they only triggered it for um, immediate alert situations like uh, hurricanes, amber alerts, silver alerts. And um, I know that uh, at least one person I know got a personal heads up about it. Uh, happening because she was actually in Hawaii when they received the erroneous erroneous uh, incoming missile oh, alert right, right, right. at like three a.m. Yeah, um, so they didn't want her to freak out. So <laughs> she didn't. She did not spill the beans to any of us because we were all shocked. Um, but yeah, I thought it was for things like that. And of course, it led us all to the YouTube video he had filmed nine hours previously. Um, according to the timestamp on YouTube. So I I don't know why I like there was, there was a 50 50. There was people online that were like, that was stupid of him to do that. Like I thought I nearly ran off the road. I thought, you know, there was something, you know, imminently happening. And then there were other people who were like, I don't read the local news. I don't watch local news. So this is, you know, probably was a good way to get this information out to me. And I'm thinking, Really? It's coronavirus. Like, right. really, you really should be keeping track of the news on that. So I think that it was part of our podcast yesterday, and I I can't remember. I think it was chatting afterwards, so it didn't get recorded for that podcast. Um, it kind of turned into a political conversation at work because my one of my colleagues who barely takes COVID seriously was like, ugh. He's just doing it so he gets more emergency funding for the next 30 days. And then you informed me, because you're in the know about that sort Mm -hmm. of thing, that we actually have emergency funding through the end of the year. So that's really not the reason we would get that kind of alert. No, no. And yeah, you would to get you would have to declare a disaster or an emergency to actually get any more funding specifically. Um, than we are already getting. I mean, we're getting money from CDC, from HRSA, from FEMA. We're getting it, um, you know, through grants. Uh, just about every single grant that we, the uh, public health has 
actually got extra money because of COVID. And of course, the that money is specifically for whatever the grant is for. Like um, we we get a couple of HIV um, grants that uh, go towards the treatment, prevention, and education around HIV and AIDS. And um, so all of them got supplemental awards this year to deal specifically with COVID in HIV and AIDS positive patients. So yeah, I mean, that's not, that's not how funding works. <laughs> I was a little bit surprised that the governors of Washington, Oregon and California didn't say, and don't travel to Alaska. <laughs> Yeah, it kind of makes me wonder. I think I thought they had lightened the um, Alaska travel uh, back and forth uh, between Canada because uh, we have a lot of people who kind of make that commute every once in a while for different things. And they shut us out for quite a long time, but they were starting to lighten that. And I would not be shocked to find out if they shut the border again. I, I wouldn't be surprised either considering how much the U.S. numbers are rising and we'll talk about that in Housewives Weekly because that is definitely an item farther down my list. <laughs> um, so I did look up L.A. County because I kind of wanted to get a sense of what was happening in the L.A. County ER with COVID-19 and I couldn't couldn't really get a sense of of what's going on. I mean they, they do say that their cases are surging. Hospitalizations remain high. Um, their numbers as of today, they had 3,061 3, new cases as of today and three additional deaths today in L.A. County. Um, if you go to covid19.lacounty.gov, they have tons of resources listed for the area, including... Um, specifically looking at ways to feed vulnerable communities during the pandemic. Hmm. Um, unrelated, somewhat unrelated to COVID, but very important actually in terms of our national security and our continued response to things like a global pandemic. So Donald Trump still hasn't conceded the election which means that the GSA, General, um, oh, God, I wrote down. Services Administration. Thank you very much. I was going to say I wrote down what it was, what it stood for, and then I didn't. We um, have a state level G GSA. So. <laughs> so that means that the GSA is still holding up transition funds. Mm -hmm. um, and it is the responsibility of the administrator of the GSA to give what is called ascertainment where basically the administrator says, okay, it looks like this is the person who won the election. So this person needs access to transition funds so that they can set up offices and get their transition team in place. And they need access, access to the presidential daily brief so they have the security information that they need to move forward and plan for their administration. So currently Joe Biden doesn't have access to that information. Um, I really want to encourage people to get a hold of the GSA and let them know that's not okay. So the administrator is a woman named Emily Murphy. She was appointed by Donald Trump four years ago. The main number for the GSA is 1-844-GSA-4111. Again, that's 1-844-GSA-4111. Um, her personal number, which apparently now is just this constant loop of, please press one, please press. <laughs> but in case you can get through, her personal number is 202-501-2472. Again, that's 202-501-2472. I called the GSA a couple of days ago and said, you know, I am sure that you're getting tons of, of calls. I know this is just a general number. I know that you probably have nothing to say about the transition funds, but please, however you can forward this message, they have to be released. She has to give ascertainment so that we can move forward with a, a peaceful transfer of power and so that, that our, our president-elect can be appropriately prepared. So I would just encourage people to, to get a hold of the GSA and let them know what your thoughts are. Yeah. It, this is this is not the time to to kind of be messing around with that kind of right um, 
Um, I, be nice to the person who answers the phone. I was. I was like, thank you for taking the time. I know this probably was not part of your job two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> um. So in the Bush v. Gore era of 2000, when we didn't get election results um, for over a month, um, I just like to remind people that... Um, it less than a year after Bush's election, uh, 9-11 happened. And it has been speculated that had they, they, he, he, be, he had Bush been getting the, the briefings, um, that, you know, maybe we could have caught that before that. So hmm. there's also, however, some speculation that he was getting briefings that he wasn't reading. I will just point that out. <laughs> Fahrenheit 9-11, Michael Moore. That that absolutely could be. It is in the nation's best interest, though, for uh, assertion to... For, for ascertainment to occur. Uh, absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Um, and especially now. Right. Because we are in the midst of, depending on what part of the country you're in, either the second or third surge of the pandemic. And we have we are every day breaking our record of new cases. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I we've talked about this on the podcast before. Um, every time, every day you hear today broke a record for the amount of COVID cases. And the reason why you hear that every single day is every single day we break the record. Well, which was the previous day. And the other thing is, is the record, the record that we're breaking is actually from exposures two weeks ago. Right. So it's right, just going to continue to go up. Terrifies me for the holidays. All right. So this is important and also somewhat related to the pandemic and overall related to some of the issues that were brought up in this movie. So the ACA, there's a challenge, currently a challenge to the ACA in front of the Supreme Court, and it looks like the Affordable Care Act is going to survive largely intact. Um, this week, Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh, it galls me to say that, um, signaled that they're likely to uphold the bulk of the ACA. It is important for people to know that if the ACA is struck down completely, 52 million Americans stand to lose their health insurance. God. On top of that, and this is a number from the end of August, I could not find a more current number. 12 million people this year have lost health insurance because of the pandemic. So we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. Our numbers are the worst that they have ever been. And thus far, we know for sure that 12 million people have lost their insurance because of financial losses incurred during the pandemic. Oh, that's, what do you say about that? That's Well, so here's what I say about that. <laughs> I want to put a plug in for a group called the Physicians for a National Health Program. If you go to pnhp.org, you can look at their information, and they really are advocating for single payer, something like a Medicare for all, so that there is equal and fair access for all citizens. So I, I you know, I make no bones about it. I believe in single payer. I believe that we should all have the same basic health care. If you want to get a boob job, go pay for that on your own time. I don't really care. But I think that all of us should have basic coverage for things like diabetes, high blood pressure, and a, a COVID infection. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nobody should. Be... No one should go bankrupt because yeah. they can't, because of, of healthcare expenses. Yeah. Michael, Michael Moore, sicko. <laughs> and, you know, I think we'll probably talk about it a little more because uh, one of the, the doctors pointed out. In fact, I wouldn't even talk about it because it's my bad for the film. So Okay, so <laughs> I have one, I have two more things to say in Housewives Weekly, and we're almost to our, our summer, winter, and uh, road construction. So our COVID numbers today in the, in the United States, we broke 11 million total cases today. That is a gain of a million cases in less than a week. That's how bad our surge is right now. So... In basically nine months, we were, well, in basically eight months, we were like 
10 million cases. And then in the last week, we gained another million. That's pretty grim. So um, this is, I, I don't know if this belongs here or in bycatch. Um, uh, I follow comedian Jen Kirkman. And of course, comedians haven't had much to laugh at lately. Um so well, I they, don't. If it's something funny, I don't want to no, cheapen no, no. what it, I. I don't want to cheapen what I'm about to say because the other thing no. I wanted to say was the number of deaths we've had. So uh, it's not at all. They they you know a lot of a lot of comedians that I follow now are tweeting very serious things. And Jen Kirkman retweeted Kimberly Prather PhD. Uh, there is a critical message that needs to get out to save lives. Holiday gatherings are going to do an enough to accelerate the pandemic without having people thinking that they can sit in their cozy living room slash dining room at opposite ends of a six foot tape measure and they will be safe. Um, this is actually not the tweet. I, I, this is a very long tweet by her, but she talks about, um, doing CPR on a, um, otherwise healthy 20 something year old. Um, and they expired. And going from that and getting off work to seeing as she's, you know, taking the taking her route home, she's seeing uh, full dining rooms and bars in restaurants. Um, So, you know, she goes from working on a 20 something year old with covid, you know, who dies to seeing the people just like that person out and about like nothing's going on and it, it's just it was very surreal for her to see that so to follow that up our numbers dead as of today 246,006 deaths attributed to covid in the united states and i just want to say in direct response to that tweet when you do things like go out and party or when you do things like go out and don't wear your mask or wear your mask at half mast and get in the faces of the rest of us, you are cheapening those deaths. You are slapping those families in the face. And for me as a healthcare worker, you are slapping me in the face. You know, we talked before the podcast and I it's basically akin to drunk driving for me at this point. Um, You are not only putting your own life at risk, but you are putting everybody else's life at risk when you drink and drive. And so now when you do foolish things, this could affect your health and this could affect the health of anyone you come into contact and anyone that person comes into contact. And I, I would not would be, I would not want to be responsible for, somebody else's mom dying because they caught COVID from me. Uh, You know, I have nothing nice to say right now. (laughs) (laughs) Because I have had another exposure and I, I'm having some symptoms this weekend. And I'm like, am I just imagining all of this because I know I've had an exposure or am I truly symptomatic? I think I get to get another nasal swab this week. That's so exciting. Yeah. And just the fact that some of the people that are out there exposing other people uh, are are doing so actually knowingly. We, we are having an epidemic of people who know that they have been exposed and they don't believe it's that big of a deal or I don't have any symptoms. So, uh, you know, I'm not spreading it. And yeah, again, it's it's like drunk driving you know even buzz driving is drunk driving and you are putting everybody else's health and safety at risk and yeah all right my last things in housewives weekly because we are 48 minutes in and we've barely talked about this movie (laughs) (laughs) um i just want to encourage people to go to votesaveamerica.com We still have two Senate seats that are going to runoff elections, both of them in Georgia, John Ossoff, Ossoff, excuse me, I said his name incorrectly, and Raphael Warnock. Um, They're going up against two of the most corrupt people who are currently in the U.S. Senate, Kelly Loeffler, who 
engaged in insider trading based on knowledge that she had about the coronavirus and about stock sell-offs. And then Senator Perdue, I can't remember Senator Perdue's first name offhand, but he is blatantly racist and horrible. So you can adopt Georgia. Um, There are various things that you can participate in, like phone banking, text banking. I believe that there probably will be a, a postcard blitz you can donate there are several different links for for how to donate to different causes that will help people get to the polls so that they can vote that will help the candidates individually so i would really encourage people because if you're listening to this if you're still with us this far in you're probably as liberal (laughs) as we are i would really encourage people to see what they can do to help push those candidates over the edge in georgia you know and i i love the things that i see on tiktok um where they are encouraging people who were not 18 and not eligible to vote right. in the presidential election and, of course, the election now that they are having to do a runoff on. Um, between now and the time that the uh, next election will happen, I think it was I think it was 25,000 uh, people in Georgia will be turning 18. And so they're trying to get them registered to vote. So, of course, TikTok you know, being mostly Gen Z, uh, they're really, really trying to mobilize getting uh, newly 18 year olds to register. And I just, I still love TikTok. And I believe that I heard on Pod Save America or Love It or Leave It this weekend that as long as you turn 18 before January 5th, on or before January 5th, you can sign up. You can register to vote. You don't have to wait to turn 18 to register to right. vote in the runoff election. So please, if 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 you know someone who lives in Georgia who's about to turn 18 and they're going to turn 18 right before the the runoff election, please encourage them to register to vote. Yeah. All right. Um, I've pretty much said the stuff that I have in Housewives Housekeeping. I'm fed up with COVID. I'm fed up with having things crammed up my nose. I'm fed up with people making stupid decisions. And I'm spending Thanksgiving alone. Thank you very much to all of you out there who are making stupid decisions. We're get, we're going to get an explicit label for a reason. You can go fuck yourselves. <laughs> I'm done. You know, uh, our our one use of curse word per like six episodes or whatever. <laughs> right, we get, right, right, right. Um, <laughs> that is a very appropriate use of it. I just, yeah. I'm so over it. I'm so over people being stupid. And I was in the grocery store the other day because I couldn't click list some of the things that I needed. And it was insane. People were wall to wall. And I would say... 60% of people were not masked or were not masked appropriate, appropriately. They didn't have their noses covered. Ugh. Ugh. All right. So do you have anything to add to either the weekly or housekeeping, or do you want to go straight into summer winter road construction? Let's go straight into summer winter road construction. Okay. What have you got? Um, so my summer, my good, uh, came rather late in the episode and I didn't write down their names, but, um, well, her name, uh, the nurse that was arguing with the doctor. (laughs) All right. So that's part of my bad. So go ahead. Oh, yeah. That surprised me. Oh, no, no, no. You'll understand why. Okay. So uh, she was arguing with Dr. Danny Chang about um, the... If you change one little thing. The changes he was trying to implement um, and the specifically the fast track um, and how she was saying you cannot fast track a patient because, you know... Because they're not really ultimately a fast track. Right. Uh, yeah. She pointed out so they were trying to get someone in and out for uh, they came in with a headache and it was like, oh, they, you know, they have a migraine. We'll give them some uh, probably some Demerol and some anti-nausea meds and we'll send them home. Well, it turns out to be a brain tumor. And now, you know, five other departments from the hospital are involved and they're waiting on orders and the person's taking up a bed that, you know, uh, could have been a more critical patient. But he also pointed out that 
you know, they're in a code black at the time. And this person could have got tired of waiting 14 hours in a waiting room, gone home and never did follow up treatment. And their brain tumor would have been worse off later on down the line. So or, you know, we possibly have died from it. So, okay, so I would argue that a brain tumor is not an emergency. It's not, no. I respect that that patient's brain tumor probably would not have been caught had that not happened. Mm -hmm. That nurse was actually going to be my hero because, <laughs> because she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and she has some very realistic concerns. And this is actually a conversation that I've had with a couple of other nurse practitioners. So the difference between the way that nurses and nurse practitioners are treated by their professional board as compared to the way physicians are treated by their professional board, night and day. So the medical mm -hmm. board is like, oh, you made a little mistake. It's okay. We're just going to slap you on the wrist and you can keep practicing. Have a great, wonderful, wonderful, productive life. The board of nursing is like, you looked at me cross-eyed. You, <laughs> you are dead to me. Surrender your license now. Ugh. And so, you know, that nurse's point was when you make little changes like this and you create situations where you think it's totally manageable on your end, you're doing things like jacking up my nurse patient ratios. Yes. Endangering care, you know, making jeopardizing good care and putting nurses in situations where they could potentially lose their licenses. And if well, I lose my license, I don't eat and I don't pay my bills and I don't work. Well, and so, I mean, if you have, and this is, I mean, this is a big part of my good is if you have enough uh, nurses who are you know, either there, they were put into a situation and they get their license yanked or they don't mm, feel comfortable. No, no, I'm here to tell you. Oh, like, <laughs> let me finish, please. Okay. I'll let you finish and then I'm going to knock you down anyway. Go ahead. No, no, no. But it, like, if they get put into a situation and they're, um, they feel like they're like, maybe they're not going to work at that hospital. And then this hospital later on had a shortage of nurses and they had to start setting down other places to, to bring in nurses because they were having such a staffing shortage. And, you know, I just, I really, I respected her, uh, you know, going to him and being like, this isn't working. But I also respected that they came to a compromise and they kind of got back to something a little more like C how Seabooth was. Oh, we're going to talk about that next. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it seemed to um, alleviate a lot of their issues. Their wait times went down. Um, so that was my good. So now you can knock it down. So what I will tell you is the reason they had a nursing shortage is not because nurses were like, working at county sucks. It's because county was not able to pay competitively mm -hmm. as compared to some of the hospital systems in the area. I will also tell you as someone who's been a nurse for nearly 30 years and who now is a nurse practitioner, nurses don't unionize. Nurses don't stand up for each other. Nurses aren't all like... We're going to we're going to stand in solidarity and this is a terrible place to work and we're going to take care of each other. No, nurses eat their young. Uh, right, but I like I wouldn't want to work in that environment if I can go to a, and go into a private practice and get much better treatment and mm. have an easier time, you know. No, it just it doesn't exist. The, number 1, the ideal nursing job doesn't exist. Number 2, <laughs> nurses don't take care of each other. Nurses eat their young. <laughs> I, I just, I, 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 I've been doing it for a long time. I, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. I've got nothing good to say. So, but were you on the nurse's side or the doctor's side for that one? I was definitely on the nurse's side for that one because yes. I, I appreciated that she at least tried to stand up for what was right and what was good patient care and what was safe patient care. Mm -hmm. I under I recognize and I understand that he was trying to make a change to get patients in and seen more quickly, but her point was, you are you are creating a situation where where we are potentially giving unsafe care. Yeah, yeah. All right. That said, not having well, anything nice to say. Oh, go ahead. Do you have something oh, else wait, to no, say? No, I was just say what was your good. So my good was actually seeing other idealists. 
I mean, I went into this because I was an idealist. I wanted to help people. I wanted to do something where I felt like I was giving back, where my life had meaning. And I still work with people who are underserved. I still make less than most of my peers. And I'm still in a situation where I'm asked to do a lot more with a lot less than a lot of my peers. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually had a patient this week who was like, F you, F them, F everybody, nobody gives an F. And I looked at her and I was like, all right, I don't usually talk to patients this way. And I actually, she didn't say nobody gives an F. She was like, F you, F them, you know, basically she was horrible. And then she said, nobody gives a shit. And I looked at her and I said, I give a shit. I come here every day because I give a shit. And I put up with stuff like what I'm putting up with right now from you because I give a shit. Mm -hmm. I want you to have a better quality of life. I want you to get the health care that you need. That's why I'm standing here. And that's why I chart on my own time so that I have good charts. And that's, you know, take up my weekends and yeah. So 30 years in, as jaded as I am, and as much as I say things like nurses eat their young, which is 100% true, (laughs) it was still great seeing other idealists and actually watching them grapple with some bitter reality because it is a daily struggle working in healthcare of idealism versus reality. Yeah. And and I would say that most of us went into healthcare not thinking we were going to make a lot of money. Not thinking we were going to change the world, but thinking maybe we were going to help people, you know, yeah. and, and to, to fight that battle in your soul every day is as that one doctor said, Dr. Ang, I think her name was, it's soul crushing. Yeah. Yeah. So it was good to see idealists. It was good to see people fighting for things that they cared about and fighting for their patients. And while I I didn't necessarily agree with some of the things that some of the physicians did or said, it was good to see people fighting for things that they cared about. Yeah. All right. What's your bad? Uh, my bad, and we started to talk about this earlier, and I said that it was my bad, so we stopped talking about it, is that... We have a healthcare system that instead of spending pennies a day on on insulin, providing insulin to somebody. That was so great. I wrote that down. Yes. Yes. We will spend tens of thousands of dollars treating them in an emergent situation when they have a heart attack or a stroke or they, you know, have a, a... infected foot and the foot needs to be cut off because of diabetes that could have been treated for pennies a day. And it's just, I, I see that all the time where we are constantly mopping the spill up from the bottom, you know, it's, it's, yeah, same here. I, I just, I have been fortunate enough my entire life to have been able to have a job that I have had excellent medical coverage. Um, I, very, very few times in my life have I ever been without insurance. And, um, you know, having asthma, it, I can't go without my inhalers for too long or, you know, I will be in an emergent situation. So uh, an inhaler that cost $10 for three of them over the Mexican border, like 20 years ago, because I was having somebody get them for me that way. Um, it was it was between that or visiting an ER, and that is not an appropriate use of an emergency room. Even though you know I would have been in acute respiratory distress, I should not be visiting an ER for an asthma attack. I should have an inhaler and. Like I said, luckily I've I've had insurance most of my life and I haven't had to experience that, but you I you see people all the time put uh put off going to the doctor because they can't afford it and it actually winds up being more expensive later. It is much less expensive to, you know, treat a, a early stage cancer than it is to treat an end stage cancer, you know. Dude, I see it every, every day. day. <laughs> Yeah, it just that that breaks my heart. And we are the only westernized country that does it this way. Well, and and I wrote it down multiple times. And I'll just say it as kind of a tack on to your winter. Our system is so broken. Mm -hmm. It's so incredibly broken. 
It is. And and I just I I see the ramifications nearly daily of situations where people put off care, put off care, put off care, and then end up in dire straits. And and or then ultimately qualify for something like Medicaid or Medicare and end up costing a huge amount of money that all of us are responsible for. Exactly. When they when exactly as that physician said, you know, they could have spent pennies a day on some insulin or some some oral medication and prevented all of those complications. Yeah. Uh, So it it was pointed out uh, in in the documentary that in 1986, Congress passed a law saying that all hospitals must treat you until you are well enough to be discharged. And so if you think that you are not paying for somebody else's medical bills, you are paying for that. You are paying for Medicare and Medicaid, and we are paying a lot more and we receive a lot less than we would under a single payer health healthcare. And not and only just, that, but the insurance premiums that you and I pay are a lot higher right. because we are making up for an industry having to to cover for people that they either don't get paid for at all or that they get paid low rates, i.e. Medicare Medicaid. Mm-hmm. I mean the whole system is completely jacked up. I I completely disagree with with clinics and hospitals being able to charge an insurance company one rate and Medicare an entirely different rate and get reimbursed at different rates. I mean, it's just the whole system is completely jacked up. But yes, I mean, we, you think you're not, not paying for people to see, listen to Smalls. He's completely disgusted. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you think you're not paying for those people who don't have insurance. You are, you're just paying for it differently. Yes. It would actually yes. be so much cheaper if you would just suck it up and become a part of, you know, the rest of the industrialized world and have single payer care. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, they, they always talk about how much it will cost to insure everybody, but they don't talk about how much we are already paying of that cost. It is already coming out of your taxes. It's already coming out of your paycheck. I, you know, I pay my my federal income tax and I also pay my employer pays part of my insurance I pay part of my insurance I have co-pays if you added all of that money up and said you know you're gonna your taxes are gonna go up by x amount I could look at how much my employer pays which if my employer didn't have to pay that that money should come back to me as a benefit. So that is coming out of my pocket. My portion's coming out of my pocket. My co-pays are coming out of my pocket. Any amount that my insurance does not cover over and above comes out of my pocket. I pay for, you know, so much for prescriptions and there are, so you are paying. <laughs> like, don't, don't think that when you hear somebody say it's gonna cost this many billion dollars a year, you're already paying it. Yeah. All right. Dr. Chang. He's my bad. <laughs> he is majorly, majorly on my bad list. And you probably didn't even hear it. It was a throw throwaway line in the documentary when they started doing their 20 chair experiment. Uh-huh. He said, now they get to be seen by doctors and not nurses or mid-levels. I do remember him saying that. It, and you're, I, it did not register. Yeah, I, I could see how one could take offense to that. So I have been that nurse and I am now that, quote, mid-level. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, first of all, we don't like the term mid-level Sorry, I'm at the top of my profession. Just because my profession is different from yours doesn't mean I'm a, quote, mid-level. So don't play those kind of semantic games with me, Dr. Chang. (laughs) Number two, Dr. Chang, I spend a hell of a lot more time looking at my patients, talking to my patients, and knowing what my patients are going through than you do. So shut it. Shut it right now. Yeah, there was twice where um, I think he said it and somebody else said it where they were like, yeah, I I diagnosed the person in like two minutes and then had 50 pages of paperwork. And I'm like, you diagnosed in two minutes because a nurse did a whole bunch of work beforehand. Right. You didn't have to spend, you know, 40 minutes taking down their information and their vitals. And yeah. 
So I'm going to chalk some of this up to the arrogance of a young doctor who isn't quite done with his residency. (laughs) There are doctors who will say things like, I recognize that you're the only thing standing between me and a dead patient. (laughs) There are doctors who will say things like, I recognize that um, you're the only thing standing between me and a lawsuit. I actually used to work with a doctor who would say, don't piss off the nurse mafia. (laughs) And I'm here to tell you, Dr. Chang, don't piss off the nurse mafia. Because if you say stupid things like that, we can make your life hell. And we most likely will. I was going to say in ways that he probably doesn't even know. (laughs) Right. In ways you cannot imagine. (laughs) Yeah, no, that that really ticked me off. And that's probably part of the reason that I gave this a 4.8 instead of a 5. And that's not fair to the documentary. And that's not fair to the work that to the to the attention that they were trying to bring to significant problems. It just boy, that attitude gets old (laughs) and 30 years of putting up with that attitude really old yeah yeah all right sorry so i told you i was triggered (laughs) content warning (laughs) so my road construction my ugly is a bad ugly and it's not anything about the um documentary itself it's another broken part of the system um when they were talking about that there is no tolerance for mistakes yes um and that you are not charting for the patient you are charting for a defense yes that was just uh, that makes me so mad and don't do not get me wrong i think that if if a medical if there is an egregious medical error that, you know, costs you something significantly in life, whether, you know, you're paralyzed or, or, you know, somebody dies or if there is medical malfeasance, absolutely people need to be uh, 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 compensated for injuries or, you know, the death of a family member. Um, But when I just I it's also it's very overdone. Like, I feel like we're we're such a litigious society that, you know, that they're they're charting to basically go through a lawsuit. And it's just it's disheartening. Let me tell you, as the person who spends time creating all of that charting, (laughs) it's disheartening. Yeah. I mean, I I like to believe and I like to say that, you know, number one, I'm trying to tell my patient's story. Number two, I'm trying to create a situation where someone who follows me, if they see the patient after me, they understand what my thought process was and why I did what I did. Mm -hmm. But I am also not going to lie. I chart to cover my butt. Mm Mm-hmm. You have to. I checked this box. I checked that box. I asked them about this. I asked them about that. You know, there, and it's not even just lawsuits. It, you know, if there is any sort of investigation in, um, like a a child abuse situation or something, you know, the your your charts are subject to a lot of scrutiny by you know places you wouldn't think, and yeah. Oh, I had a case this week where the person is taking a a an MVA, a motor vehicle accident injury to a lawsuit. And I was like, look, I'm just going to be 100% honest with you. The imaging that I have shows that you have like some arthritic changes and some chronic changes in your imaging. I don't see any acute injury. Um, Yeah, my chart is probably going to be subpoenaed and it's probably going to be looked at. I cannot honestly tell you that the symptoms you're telling me are coming from the accident you're telling me about based on the imaging that I've got in front of me. Hmm. And I have to document all of that. Wow. To make sure that I've covered my butt. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that would, that was my ugly, bad, ugly, uh, road construction is just you know, another part of a broken system. 
So mine was very similar, and it, and it really did go back to exactly what we were just talking about, the charting, the forms that they have to fill out. I mean, I was looking at that the huge row of forms that, mm -hmm. that Dr. McGarry was going through to get a test ordered, and how he was talking about, you know, it's literally going to take me 25 minutes to do all of the prep work for a two-minute lumbar puncture. Yeah. And... You know, he was avoiding doing it, not because he didn't want to do that for the patient, but he didn't like. He didn't want to deal with all the garbage that he had to wade through to get there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, don't get me wrong. I have to take HIPAA training every year, too, because I work for public health, even though I do not deal with any HIPAA data. Um, uh, his whole like you have to sign into the computer every single time. Right. You know, it like I, I just there has to be a better way. Because <laughs> the time of medical professionals is very, very valuable, and especially in a place as busy as this. And if, you know, they're, you know, spending more time in charts and on computers and behind a desk and everything, that's time that's being taken away from treating people who are acutely ill or injured, or in this case, sometimes even chronically ill or injured. Yeah, I, I just, we've created a system where there are so many barriers to giving care. Yeah. And it really is true. And I really, really felt, deeply felt what they said about what, when he was like, you know, you followed me around for 30 minutes now and I maybe have spent two, pa two minutes talking with a patient. Mm-hmm. You know, and think of the, I think of the two halves of this documentary. And when we started out, we first see this crowded emergency room where there was no elbow room and they were doing, you know, procedures on people who were traumatically injured or, or, you know, in, in the midst of, of, you know, dying. Uh, and nobody was worried about HIPAA laws. Nobody was worried about, you know, unfortunately the dignity of a patient. And they did point that out later that, you know, you have, you, you would have a, a 10 year old, you know, who was sick and, you know, receiving treatment next to, you know, a, a, a criminal who has been shot and is, you know, screaming and bleeding and everything. And there, there was no dignity or privacy or anything like that. And that, you know, that too should also not really happen. But for me, it just seemed better because the doctors and nurses were being doctors and nurses. They were, you know, they were doing the, the IVs and resuscitation and, um, uh, doing the puncture when they go in between the rib. Oh, a chest tube. Yeah. Um, just it, it seemed more active and, and, you know, people were getting care and then they transitioned to the new hospital and they're separated from the patients and it's all quiet and they're doing paperwork. And, you know, meanwhile, you have 300 people out in a waiting room, you know, who are, I mean, one guy was puking. There there was somebody who was ripping off his own cast, probably because he was tired of sitting there. Um, just, yeah, I, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's no place good. Yeah, I, you know... I think that probably takes us straight into bycatch. It does. It yeah. takes us straight into bycatch. And, you know, the thing that I will say about this that I said about City of Joy is that, you know, once again, it was the right movie at the right time. I needed, needed a little bit of gratitude. I needed a little bit of, yes, there are still people out in healthcare who are doing this for the right reasons. There are still people who are really suffering, who really need us, you know, it was, it was again, the right movie at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> completely kind of off topic, um, but part of my catch, 
uh, the the woman, the fifty eight year old lawyer who had broke her foot, right? Who was, who had always had insurance and then right. like ended up homeless and right and. You know, they they were talking about how this is a county hospital and you expect to see a certain type of person here. And if people really came in and looked, you we would see people from all walks of life. And, you know, you're you're one paycheck away from disaster. And, you know, this kind of thing can happen at any time. And our healthcare system is so broken that, you know, uh, other hospitals maybe won't see you. Um, you can't afford the upfront cost, things like that. And county will take you. And so I wanted to adopt that poor woman. Like I was just like, Oh, Come I know. Me. Yeah. But I mean, 58 years old has had a successful career in law and there was embezzlement in her practice. And she is now, she now finds herself with a broken foot living in her car with no insurance and no prospects because she is, you know, at the probably the end of her viability in her career as far as other law firms would probably see and i just you know i i like i said i've i've had medical insurance my most of my life and so i've been lucky enough to avoid receiving a, a giant medical bill and i just i i i can't imagine the fear that people well I can because I have lived in fear of of you know being in an accident because I have no health insurance but it's just she did everything right she went to law school she worked her entire life she had medical insurance and something completely out of her control happened and here she is and it you know people think that <laughs> I just I can't I can't help but make a political people think that you know taxing someone who makes over four hundred thousand dollars a year is, is just the a deal breaker you know in order to have single payer health care or student loan forgiveness or you know anything like that anything you know good and you probably don't make four hundred thousand dollars a year you probably won't make four hundred thousand dollars a year you know in your lifetime good and, lord most of us won't right and so i just I I don't understand how how we're here, you know, in this day and age and we see you know other westernized countries have single payer health care and you don't have people you know who are, are face these kind of things. And yeah. <laughs> Because Americans are so terrified that someone is going to take a piece of their pie. Yep. And because Americans are so ridiculous that they always believe that they're that one job away from becoming a millionaire. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm, yeah. Your YouTube channel is going to make it big, kid. You'll make over $400,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just... I don't know how you and I got so liberal because I, you know, like, like I said, I probably wouldn't have to pay any more than I'm already paying for single health care. Um, because I, I have the privilege of having health care right now. So I am paying for it in some way. And, uh, but I am still willing to give up a little bit more of my pie for everyone else not having to face down bankruptcy because of medical debt mm -hmm. or putting off care and being worse later or, you know, going through the pain and suffering of, you know, not being able to afford your insulin. So it gets so bad that they have to cut your foot off at some point. Like, I just, I see things like that. And then I don't understand, like how I understand that and no, and other people don't. I, you know what? I don't get it either. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will literally have people telling me how evil socialized medicine is, how evil single payer is when they're sitting there telling me that they were finally able to come in and see me for care because they qualified for Medicaid or Medicare and they finally have some help with their, their medical bills and their prescription costs. 
I don't get it. I don't understand. Nope. Me either. Like, yeah. Okay, so I kept writing over and over again. I wonder what LA County and Seabooth are like now in 2020. <laughs> I, I I didn't realize that Seabooth at, at the first time I wrote it. I didn't realize that Seabooth was no longer a thing because I wrote it very early on. But now I just I would I would love to know what it looks like because I can't imagine. I can't even begin to imagine. Yeah. I mean, you you said it yourself. I mean, there's no social distancing in that waiting room. You've got people packed to the gills. You've got 100 people or 300 people sitting in a waiting room waiting for care for up to 24 hours. Yeah. The the thing that really hit me was uh, when one of them said, you know, you get you're getting off your shift and you're going home for the night and you pass by the waiting room. And then you come back the next day for your shift and you see some of the same people waiting in that waiting room. And I, I just, you know, here we are telling people not to sit in crowded rooms for long periods of time. And, you know, you have that, like, what are they doing? You know, these are people, and this is this is one of those things where I was like, okay, I need to have a little more gratitude. These are people that are so desperate for care that they'll wait for 24 hours for care. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, I mean, I wrote down a bunch of stuff, like one of the, one of the young docs said the system is sometimes bigger than you. And then one of them said, you know, that one of the really hard things about uh, Code Black is that you you walk in and you're already behind the power curve like you're already sinking when yeah. you when you walk in um he said you're losing before you've even started i will say working at a community health center that's what working at a community health center feels like too well yeah and um so you know this is the the county hospital so this is this is the oh, hospital. And that was the other thing that was shocking. They said it at the end in the end credits. Two, the, only 2% of the hospitals in the U.S. are county hospitals. Oh, that's right. So only 2% of the hospitals in the U.S. have to provide care. Yeah. And I, I, so people are already probably traveling long distances to come to this hospital for treatment. For yeah. Something they said one lady had taken four buses and then had been in the waiting room for like 20 hours. Yeah. It, it's yeah. And, and you know, however long it took her out, however many miles she had to travel for that. How many other places did she pass by that could have treated her like how many other hospitals are there in the area how many other urgent cares or emergency clinics or, or things like that are in the area but she has to go to county because it is the only place that has to treat her right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is like, right he's on the couch or the futon he's like totally enjoying himself right now He's like, stop, lighten up, you two. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You gave a good laugh. Oh, God, I sure did. Because, boy, this, this, this documentary got me really fired up. <laughs> and especially at... The time we're in now. Right. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I feel like we've kind of talked this to death. There's probably a lot more to say. But I, another good documentary. Yeah, like, I mean, it, it was another great documentary. It definitely highlights things that are still problematic in our healthcare system. It is still pertinent seven, eight years later. Um... I really want an update. I do too. Dr. McGarry, if you're out there, I really want an update. Yeah, you know, on his Twitter, he had not posted much until very recently when he started posting about um, his latest documentary. So, um, yeah, no updates from him, unfortunately. 
<sighs> well, I, I guess I just want to wrap up my rant by saying that most of us really do still care. Most of us really are still in it for the right reasons. Even the people who are in private practice, they care. They're in it for the right reasons. They are in a system that forces them to push paper and push buttons mm -hmm. and click and click boxes. Yeah. Yeah. And and just recognize that the people who are taking care of you are trying to do the to do the best that they can do in a really, really broken system. Especially now, you know we can we we have the funding to give our regular police uh, taser shields for crowd management. But our doctors and nurses in our hospitals are wearing trash bags for PPE. That's <sighs> what we are operating under. You know, I don't know how bad it is right now, but with the surge that we're experiencing, we're probably going to start to see that again. Yeah. I, I don't know that we necessarily took the time that we had between surges to really actually build up stockpile our, yeah. things yeah you know i think it's i think it's going to be better than in the beginning because it seems like other places have a better handle on it so we are not competing on the world stage for ppe like we were in the beginning um and the the countries that supply ppe like things that are made in china for instance are back up and running. And so I don't think we're going to run into the supply and demand issue that we had in the beginning, but it's nowhere where it needs to be. I mean, we actually do keep a national stockpile of PPE and, you know, I'm sure that's been depleted and we haven't got it back up to where it should be. And we're headed into another surge. Mm-hmm. I mean, even Alaska um, Providence Medical Center in Anchorage ordered a morbo, uh, mobile morgue. Uh, they ordered a refrigeration truck to uh, deal with the, the pending influx of bodies. Pretty grim. It is. And here I am going to go watch his other documentary on Netflix about uh, the pandemic. I am going to take some NyQuil and die because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that... I don't know. I just, I really hope I don't have COVID. I really hope you don't have COVID too. And not just because I have vowed to hunt down the person that gave it to you. <laughs> but because I don't want you to die. Yeah. I don't really, you know, we all do eventually. I'd rather not do it like this. No. Nope. All right. So we've got some things that we're kind of thinking about for upcoming documentaries. I think now that we're up and running on iTunes, we need to start talking with Lilith about doing The Hate You Give. Yes. Um, yeah, we've just got a few things brewing. So unfortunately, I still can't find the podcast in the other places to listen to podcasts. Uh, I did ask Rob about Spotify and he said it's been submitted. Okay. Yeah, I don't... I, uh, you know what? You can email Rob this time. <laughs> <laughs> you can bug Rob. I have bugged him mercilessly and the poor guy is probably like, oh God, she's sending me another message about the the podcast feed. Uh. <laughs> oh, I'm wrong. It is. So I, I listen to podcasts on Beyond Pod. Okay. And it has started to trickle down. At, it is on Beyond Pod. Oh, good. Very good. Yay. So, yes. Now you can find us just about everywhere you get your podcasts. Oh, well, I'll have to look and see if we're on Spotify while we're still recording and Smalls can entertain us with his, more of his joy at rubbing himself back and forth on the futon. <laughs> Oh, God. I have a Dexter who's trying to get my attention, too. 
that dog. Oh, let's see. Hmm. The social dilemma is posted twice. <laughs> That's probably my fault. That's fine. It's better than not at all. Um, we are still not on Spotify, but we're starting to trickle to other platforms, so that's good. Good. All right. Well, All right. watch out for the weirdos out there. We are the weirdos, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Have a All good right, week, everybody. Have a good week. Bye. 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 Bye.